Welcome to How to Split a Toaster, a divorce podcast about saving your relationships from True Story FM. Today, introducing the Step Toaster. Welcome to the show, everybody. I'm Seth Nelson, and I'm here with my good friend, Pete Wright. Becoming the step parent is not something we're naturally built to do. Genetic wiring can get messy when it comes to taking on parenting duties for our new spouse's kids. This week on the show, we welcome Tracy Poisoner, the essential stepmom, parenting strategies who specializes in helping divorced moms and dads navigate new parenting duties and help them raise well-adjusted, fully parented humans. She is the host of the Essential Stepmom Podcast, your trusted source for unconventional advice and inspiration about the womanly art of raising someone else's kids. Tracy, welcome to the toaster. Thank you so much. This is so much fun. And I I love the title of your show. (laughs) It's just fantastic. (laughs) <laughs> well, I guess we're I, I guess we're in it, right? You 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 can split a toaster about as easily as you can split your kid, uh, and uh, so here we go. How did you decide you needed to be a voice in step parenting, Tracy? I am a stepmom, uh-huh. um, and I'm a, I'm a mother too. I'm a biological mother, but um, I don't know. You know, I like our journey. Our my my husband and I have been together for. 15 years now. Um, We've been married for uh, seven of those years. And we really passed through a lot of different kinds of difficulty. And, you know, we we went through parental alienation and long distance parenting and full time, you know, full time parenting. So we had my husband had his kids three hours away. He was only visiting on weekends. They were never here. And eventually we ended up with kids that lived here with us full time. So we had just kind of gone through the gamut of possible things that could happen. And I remember literally waking up one day and saying, I think this is the light at the end of the tunnel. I think we're here. Like, I think all that hard stuff is behind us. And, and I mean, there's still life, you know, it's not like nothing ever goes wrong anymore, but, but like the heavy lifting was done. and. My personal background was, um, I have a lot of different personal backgrounds, but um, after being a classical musician for 25 years, I, I studied homeopathy. And We're going to be getting into that in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, don't let that just slide on by. Um, I, uh, at, while I was being a musician, I, I studied homeopathy and I became a practitioner of homeopathic medicine. And that's what I've been doing um, I eventually left my music career and went full time into homeopathy. So I've been I've been studying and practicing for you know almost twenty five years, and I learned so much in the course of studying natural medicine about human psychology and childhood development and family dynamics. It was a huge part of of what I learned because that's a lot of what I untangle in my in my practice and. I relied so heavily on all the stuff that I knew. I thought, what do people do who don't have any of this background? Like, this is crazy. You know, it was hard for me. And I had a lot of answers already. So I just, I just felt compelled somehow to, to start codifying somehow, if, if to at least see if it was possible to codify what I knew, what had worked for us, and to to verify if those same things had worked for other families or if we we're just some kind of weird one off and you know it it worked here but it's not working everywhere else so i i started investigating online i started hanging out in forums and reddits and facebook groups and conversing with other stepmoms and and i i very quickly discovered that uh Yes, like that the families that stay together who are the small minority, I'm sorry to say, like really only 30 or 40 percent of second marriages with kids actually last. It's quite dramatic. Uh, and I discovered that that people were doing the same things. They Maybe they didn't have a language for it, but they were doing a lot of the same things that we had found to be successful. And I, I just started to to collect all of this material and I opened my own group. I opened my own Facebook group by 
by inviting women that I found online who were giving really great advice. That was what I did. I, I set out invitations to 15 or 20 women I found who I thought gave really good advice. And I said, I'm going to start another group. I want you in my group. And then by the time, by the time people started coming, there was this, you know, this population of people who could give just good advice. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, so you end up becoming the essential stepmom in your work. It looks sounds like you're the essential stepmom with the womanly art of raising someone else's kids. And also you do a lot of work with undeletable dads. Yeah, I, I'm curious from both of you, Seth, I know you are a, as such a strong advocate for kids, your kids, all the kids in your life. I, I'm just curious how this. Yeah, that gets a little it confusing. does get a little confusing. Right. And and so I'm curious how this, you know, insofar as we we try not to have gendered conversations about this stuff. But, there, you know, how how much is this a, a gendered conversation that we have to have? It is in the sense that, OK, like I have I have same sex couples in my in my coaching practice, uh, which uh, like, of course, like that's, that's, that is not a big deal, but it is a gendered conversation in the sense that I only work with the biological dad and his new partner or like the stepmom and her partner, even if the biological partner is a mom, let's say, but it is a completely and totally different animal than the biological mom and her new partner is a stepdad. They couldn't be more different households. Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Okay. Let me just, I just want to understand. We're talking about you work with biological dads and new partners. Yeah. But not biological moms. That's right. They're okay. They don't need the help, right? They need other help. They they might not be okay, but I don't know how, I don't know what to do for them. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Why, why is that? Well, I can fill that in. I have been married to a woman who had a child previously. So I became a stepdad. Then we got divorced, but she is remarried to an amazing guy who is the, we call bonus dad, bonus dad, Steve, to my son, Kai. So when we're talking about Steve, we'll just say Steve, or sometimes we'll say bonus dad. But when Kai's out in public and he introduces Steve, he might just say it's Steve or he might say it's my stepdad. But in our house, I have never used the word step. Because it, in my view, has a derogatory connotation. That's why we always use bonus. So if you're going to focus on woman, biological mom with new guy or other partner in her life, I can certainly speak to that because I've had that role too. And also, I've had the benefit of the role of seeing how another man is amazing at helping raise my child. Yeah, that's fantastic. But I think that. The big difference between the bonus mom and the bonus dad role is, well, there are two things. One of them is like societal conditioned archetypes, right? Like the single mom is generally speaking, uh, some kind of heroic or possibly saintly figure, right? A single mom is like doing her best to raise her kids after, you know, a divorce. And the single dad is by and large thought of as a deadbeat. Like you have to work kind of hard to get over that, that conditioning. Interesting on that, Tracy, when I was divorced, I would say, oh, I'm a single dad. And people would say to me, oh my God, did your wife pass away? Like that never happens to single moms. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd be like, no, we're divorced. She's a single mom. I'm a single dad. But it sounds funny when you say it because yeah. most guys don't say it. And yeah. Pete knows I'm a wordsmith and I'm all about how yeah, things yeah. sound. This is just, it's gross on so many levels, of course. Let, let's it just not let, not let that the grossness sit there. That if you're a single mom, it means that the dad must have been a deadbeat. And if you're a That's single right. dad, I mean, the only way anyone would ever leave a man is if she died. Like, that's yeah. just horrible culture. It is. It is. Now, there are a lot of women that were with me in my past that would have preferred to die than stay with me. (laughs) (laughs) And I can't really argue with them. I mean, well, you know, the the continuation of that is that the stepmom is generally speaking thought of as the woman who who broke up this marriage. Yes. Oh, my God. That's what you that's the baggage that you're carrying around forever. Like explicitly or implicitly. And the stepdad is, again, a kind of hero 
who helps the single mom in this hard job of raising the kids on her own. So stepmom and stepdad are dealing with very, very different conditioned ideas of who they are. And secondly, the stepmom being a female is carrying around some evolutionarily conditioned maternal instinct. Like as a woman, you have a maternal instinct that is activated in some way when you're around kids. And in order to be successful as a stepmom, she has to yank out the plug and just get rid of that thing, throw it out the window. Your, your maternal instinct is not a help to you as a step parent, which sounds super weird. It does sound weird. I'm, I'm about to poke at that. Why, it, why it, is that so weird? It doesn't me? sound weird to me at all, actually. I need to be educated. Because I deal with this. Yeah. So I'm going to take a guess. Tracy, you tell me why I'm wrong. Go ahead. It's because, Pete, if that is what you're doing and acting in that way, inevitably, you're going to overstep your bounds. Exactly. Exactly. Hmm. A you win. plus. A plus. Look at that. Hmm. Bullseye. Yeah. Um, you yep. you have to accept that you are not the mother of these children. And there are a lot of dads who go into a second marriage with a kind of misinformed expectation that they actually want their wife to act as the mother of these kids every other week or every other weekend or even if they live full time. That's the stereotype we've been taught, Tracy. Like that's what movies taught us. So you're telling me movies aren't right? They're not right. You know, you oh, know no. the you remember the Tracy, Brady Pete's bunch? A big, like <laughs> Tracy, Pete's a big movie buff. You're crushing it's, it's his soul all right I now. Know. <laughs> I'm I'm crushing. I'm sorry. But but like the Brady bunch was a fantasy, okay? Like Mike Brady had three kids, his wife passed away. So of that's how he did. gets another wife. Yeah. But Carol, yeah. the story is that she's divorced. And her the did you ever, ever, ever hear no, that dad not. get mentioned? Did anyone ever ask about him? Is anyone ever have their nose out of joint that he's not in their life? He never showed up for custody. Like he never had weekends. He never shows up. He never he's not like giving them any money. They nobody ever talks about him. He vanished into thin air. That's not that's not real. You guys, the Brady Bunch has lied to me for 45 years. You know what else? They had a full-time <laughs> well, live-in housekeeper, okay? Yeah, right. <laughs> right. That's, and also, Pete, if they lied to you for 45 years, you're watching way too many reruns. That's on you, brother. <laughs> Nick at night, man. <laughs> I, I, I feel like this gets into so many of the tropes that we have to come yeah, absolutely. back, right? You've, you've already, we've already talked about those, but the others are the, the tropes about the kids, right? And these are the ones that I've heard from my friends when I was young whose parents are, are, were divorced. Uh, no, he's not my real dad. She's not my real mom, right? There's this whole connotation of what is real. And then on the other side, I had a friend who referred to her biological mother as her egg mom because her relationship with her stepmom was actually stronger. Yeah. So she had an egg mom and a mom. Each family is different and each relationship is different. And I think when kids who are then adults or even if they're children say stuff like, oh, that's my egg mom and this is my mom. They're talking about relationships yes. there, right? And I think Tracy's coming at it from a different point of view, um, where as the step parent, how do you manage expectations? How do you interact with children? How do you support your spouse, but not overstep your bounds? And whatever relationship forms, it forms because that relationship will most likely be stronger when you don't overstep your bounds. 100%. Well, this is the this is that this is my puzzled face because isn't that what we're talking about building relationships of trust and respect somehow between all the parties in in the family in the new unit? And the way that you do that paradoxically is by staying out of the way of the relationship between the kids and their parent. And step dads do that instinctively and naturally. And it's really hard for stepmoms not to do, not to overstep in the mothering. Sometimes less is more. Always. In this scenario. It's always. So let me give you, <laughs> let me give you an example. And sometimes, and, and, and Tracy, so, you know, I've been with my girlfriend for 11 years. She's amazing. When people ask me, how many kids do I have? I get this puzzled look and I say, you think I'd know the answer to that yeah. question. <laughs> but, and I say, I have one biologic, I have four kids in my heart one biological, one nice. former stepdaughter, and my girlfriend has two kids. So 
the good news is I only have to pay for half of one college, <laughs> you know, out of that's, all that. Uh, but that's some college I'm, math. I, I, I get love it. that. I have four I, kids exactly. in my heart. I just love yeah. that. What a nice way of saying it. But my girlfriend, who is amazing with my son, will step in really to correct me. Like she'll say to him, this is what your dad's trying to say, <laughs> right? Like she'll translate. And sometimes I will go to her and I say, I'm not getting through to him on this. She's like, I'll talk to him. Yeah. And, and she'll say what I perceive to be the exact thing that I said. <laughs> and he listens to her, <laughs> you know. Yeah, we have that here too. Like my, my stepkids talk to me a lot, like a lot to the point where my husband says, well, you know everything. They talk to you. They don't tell me anything. Mm -hmm. I am very sensitive to the energetics in our household. And I think there are energetics in every household, right? It's when we talk about family dynamics, that's the, the word dynamics is referring to, to something energetic, right? And the issue is that, that the kids need to be seeking the approval and the connection with their biological parent. And it's great if you have, if there's another supportive adult in the house, who loves them, you know, like that's great. But nobody ever went to therapy as an adult to say, you know, I really never had the relationship I really wanted with my third grade teacher. Or, you know, I never felt I was good enough for my little league coach. Like that doesn't happen. You only go to therapy to work out your shitty relationship with your mother or your father or both of them. I don't know, Tracy. My third grade teacher was rough on me. I've been to therapy a long time on that. <laughs> no, it's really all about, it's yeah. all about the, the connect and it doesn't stop. Like even now my, my stepkids are 21 and 23 and like, they love me. We spend tons of time together and they love that I give them life advice and it's all good. But it, when push comes to shove, I still get out of the way so that they can have a private conversation with dad without, without my opinion kind of coloring what he says or thinks, you know, that it's important. So I'm going to give you some things that I've done in the past and tell me if these are like practical things people can do. Do okay. I get to keep score? Okay. Is there a scorekeeping? Any sort of tally? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I need to, yeah. Can, but is only, there a only way Seth could lose this game? That's what I need yeah, to know. Yeah, I was going to say, only right. if I lose, Pete, right? <laughs> I, I, you took my joke. <laughs> so, for example, we're all together and my girlfriend says to her child, clear the table. It is not my job then to follow up and be like, dude, you're not clearing the table. Dude, you're not clearing the table. That's like, bad. Now, what I might do is step in and say, hey, man, I'll help you. Yeah. And do it with them. Perfect. Right. Yeah. Or, hey, she'll say, take out the trash. And I might say to him, hey, you want to take out the trash and I'll do the bag or you want to do the bag and I'll take out the trash. Like I might awesome. offer support. You know, see, look, I'm two for two, Pete. I know. Okay. Don't let it go to your head. <laughs> look, can I ask a question? There is yeah. something here that, that that feels like I'm I'm hearing, and and that is, as soon as it becomes like uh, some sort of order, then it's a it's uh, you're getting into the parenting mode, and that's bad. But if you make it an interpersonal relationship request, like I can totally imagine, instead of even if nobody's asked to take out the trash, is just saying, "Hey, would you do me a favor?" Would you take out the trash and I'll clear exactly. the table? Like exactly. you're doing me a favor as a human being, not as a stepdad, you know, son or daughter. Exactly. Not as a parent. Yeah, exactly. Look at look at that. I got a, is that a bonus point? Yep. Awesome. I think you get two points for that because you're not even a step parent. Right. So you just intellectually came up with that. I had to learn from my mistakes. <laughs> so you're ahead. Noted. Okay. That's great. Okay. What else you got, Seth? Do you have other story, uh, other tests? Yeah, the other test is when the mom or I'll just say the biological parent is getting on to the kid about something. Yeah. Right? Sometimes I might just like poke in there and say, she's having a bad day. Hmm. I'm just giving you advice and counsel. You don't have to take it. I'm here to help you through this. Do you want my advice? And I'll ask if they want my advice. And sometimes they'll say no. And sometimes they'll say yes. I mean, it, I would say that depends on the tone of voice and the nature of the relationship that you have with your with your partner. Um, you don't want to be like undermining 
the parent saying like she's way out of line. She's like having one of her having one of her days or something. There, see, I get a minus point there, Pete. A little bit. Well, I, you yeah. can kind of, I, I, I sort of get that. Like, and I, I feel like I try to do that with my, uh, not to do that with my own kids, right? Which is to say, oh, she's having a bad day, which can be interpreted, especially I think for younger kids, that there are certain like days or moods that you find your mother in that are you're not going to be able to deal with her. So we need to somehow protect you against her. Like, I don't want to convey that in any way, shape or form. Yeah. And that's never what I mean when I say it. And I think Tracy's right. It's on the relationship. It's not what you do in the first day. It's- and I, I think also there's space for some kind of really high level redirecting of a, of a tense situation to get the result that you want by lightening the mood. Like when yeah. you can see that your spouse and their child are locked in a ineffective kind of battle. And that you could get the result that everybody wants by interjecting some levity and moving it towards a resolution. Like, I'm not going to say that's a bad idea, but it wouldn't be right to have the tone of like, hey, dude, I'm on your side. Your mom is out of line here. Well, and, and check me on this. My hunch is that interjection would be far better served doing it with your partner and not your partner's kid. Right. Exactly. Instead, exactly. go to your spouse and I'm say, I'm not hey. going to get my head bitten <laughs> off. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I think all the best second marriages are based on fear. Don't you? I think. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that 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 makes a lot of sense. Yeah. In in terms of establishing trust and and a relationship. And I will tell you to that point, Pete. We all have our blind spots. We all have things about our personalities that we don't see. And and my girlfriend calls me out on mine all the time. I mean, literally, when my child was younger, I could make him cry by the tone of my voice. She called it stern voice. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it took me a long time even to recognize what I was doing and when I was doing Mm -hmm. it. So when they started calling me out on it, it really made me more self-aware, which then made me a better parent. Right? Yeah. But that's that's presumably not in front of your child. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Like she was like, do you understand what just happened there? I'm like, no, what are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> like I asked him to take out the trash. He started crying. Did you understand the tone of your voice? Like, and you know, it was later when he was in bed and stuff. So I agree with you hundred percent on that, Tracy, not in front of the child. Yeah. Um, let, let me ask you uh, best practices in terms of uh, introducing the stepmom relationship to, to kids. I, how, what is it? Is there a best practice that you've discovered in all the work that you've done with folks? I, I can't reflect on my own experience except to say that I was lucky and I would love for people to be able to reproduce in some way the situation that we had. My partner, my husband now, was just a friend who rented a room in my house because he was living three hours away. And he came to work in the city where I live. Actually, this is the orchestra part because I used to play in a symphony orchestra. And he was invited here on a one-year contract from a city far away. And the orchestra suggested that he call me because I lived nearby and I had a room for rent in my house. So that was how we met. And uh, he lived here for four years. And so I kept encouraging him to invite his wife and kids to come, you know, because we had extra room here and, uh, you know, come on a weekend or bring them or whatever. So I had met his kids many, many times before we got together, but I was just the lady who lives here. In order to kind of reproduce the atmosphere where you're not being introduced as somebody who is like highly charged with, with meaning into their life, to pop in and out like this is my friend blah 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 and you come and you 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 either meet up somewhere you know for an ice cream or you come over and you say hello for a few minutes and you leave like to to make little short you know come for an hour spend some time go away because the the main thing you want to establish is that you are not going to be energetically standing between the kids and their parent you come over, you meet them, and you go away. If you are dating somebody who has not met your children, and you're about to introduce them to the children in a very healthy way that Tracy just described, you should let your former spouse know. Yeah, hey, I agree. This person's important to me. 
I would like to introduce the children to them, to this person and them to the children. And it's just going to be a short little meeting. But if you start hearing this name, this is who they're referring to. And anything you want to know about them, just let me know. Yeah. Yeah. So it saves so many problems because then if you have a healthy relationship with your former spouse about this and the name of your significant other, boyfriend, girlfriend comes up when they're at the other house. Oh, yeah, we met Susie today. Yeah. And then mom will be like, oh, I heard she's really great. Did you like her? Like maybe be supportive and not be like, who's Susie? What did you do? How long was she there? Did she stay the night? Like just drilling the kids, right? Yeah. yeah. And you you don't want the kids to get drilled and you want them to also not have to hide anything. If you literally, you know, come over for half an hour or an hour and share an ice cream or do something fun and go away, it was not a big deal. And they won't present it like it was a big deal. And you also don't want to be physically affectionate in front of the kids. Like they don't have a way to really process that. You know, it takes time until they understand who who's who in this situation and who are you to each other. And of course, for a stepmom, there's a default feeling that you are in some way threatening their mother's status. Yeah. And you're threatening their their connection with their dad because they want every, you know, they want to suck up every second of dad when they're with you. And if somebody else is there taking dad's attention for 1% of the time, they only notice the 1% when he's not paying attention to them. Sure. What do you do if the kids just don't like the stepmom? How do you navigate the new relationship uh, angst when there's angst? I think it goes both ways. It's important for the stepmom to not have expectations that she's necessarily going to fall in love with these kids because there are a lot of women in my group who really beat themselves up about not liking or loving their stepkids. They feel that they are supposed yeah. to love these kids because they love their partner. That's another but stereotype, right? That, it is. that the stepmom's always supposed to be the one who's fighting for the love of the kids. And yeah. what if the kids are jerks? It happens sometimes. That's human. It does happen. But what <laughs> I do tell the dads is that you can tell your kids, you don't have to like Tracy. You don't have to like her, but you do have to be polite with her because she's my friend. And I'm your dad, and I need to teach you how to behave with people that you don't like. This is a life skill. You're going to have bosses that you don't like. You're going to have roommates you don't like. You're going to have teachers you don't like. You're going to have in-laws you don't like. Exactly. And this is why I brought around a bunch of mean women in front of my kid. (laughs) Always the parade of hate. Yeah. Yes. You're going to learn this skill whether you like it or not. Yeah. You know, (laughs) no, as a dad, you can say, I respect that you don't like her and that's okay. You don't have to like her, but I do have to insist that you're polite with her. You have to say hello when you come into the room. I won't let you be rude. And whatever you feel inside your heart is, is your business. I, I'm not going to force you to like somebody that you don't like, but you do have to be polite. I love that advice because it it wraps up everything we've been talking about, right? You have to be polite. And the exchange or the unspoken sort of the subtext is where the relationship we're building is not one where she's going to be your default other parent, right? You have to be polite just as she will be polite to you and we'll all work together. But I'm still your dad. Yeah. I'm the one who's going to tell you, you know not to cross the street without looking both ways. Kind and of it's thing. funny because you don't know how many people, like it's a huge weight off their shoulders when I tell them that. It's like, that's a, that's all I have to say. <laughs> like, yeah. or, or for the stepmoms, when they hear that they don't, you don't have to like your stepkids. Like you're not a horrible person. What are the odds that you could go to any playground in the city and grab two random kids and bring them home and that you would you would love them? Like yeah. if if the world worked that way, Biological children would be so insecure if you thought that your mom or dad could bring home a couple of other random kids and love them as much as they love you. Like, what would that mean for you? We're not made that way. Yeah, I also think on this too, which we haven't touched on, so much, Pete, depends on the age of the kids. Yes, it does. I was just going to ask that. Is there a, like, a, what are the the pitfalls depending on what age bracket you're kind of, you're in when you're making these introductions? When they're little, 
um, it's yeah, that's daddy's friend. That's mommy's friend. They don't, it's like easy, right? It's easier, right? When they're teenagers and they know what's going on or preteens or, you know, let's just make this a little more complicated. You're bringing home one of their friend's parents because you guys met at the soccer field, Mm -hmm. right? Like that has some interpersonal skills on how does that affect my relationships with my friends at school? When my dad's dating a friend of mine's mom, that seems weird to me. What's going on here? You know, so there's all sorts of traps going on with that. When do you um, go to their first kid's event? You know, do you get invited to that event? Like, um, how does that work? And I think after they've met them just a couple times, that's a very, like, like Trace was saying, you're in, you're out. I asked my son, is it okay if she comes to your place? She would really like to see that. And yeah, sure. It's perfect because she's there not interacting with him because yeah. he's on stage or not interacting because they're on the field or doing whatever they do. And then at the end, you say, oh my God, that was amazing. You were great. And you're out. Yeah. And there were many circumstances where I chose not to go because the bio mom was very uncomfortable being in that kind of situation with me. And so the kids would know that because I was very supportive and I always came to stuff. So, and she lived far away. So if she was making the long trip to come to where we live to be at something, or if we were going, if we were going there, I I sometimes would choose to stay away because I know that it's a socially awkward situation for the child. And I don't need it. I need for the child to know that, like, I want to hear all about it when it's done. Take lots of pictures and tell me all about it. Like, I'm there, I'm supportive, but I'm not going to force them into a box where they, like, have to have this cringy experience. That's minimizing conflict. Yeah. And I tell parents, if you can, without conflict, if you're at a event for your child, sit next to each other. Oh, yeah. My former spouse and I save seats for each other and our respective others that come along, um, that are coming to the the show with us. Now, if you can't do that because there's conflict, then don't do it, right? But when my kid was little, I would always give him directions that it was okay to do things when he came off, like say the soccer field. He comes running, there's two parents. And I would say, give mommy a hug. Like I would give the permission to go to mommy first because that kid's making a choice yes. and a kid should never have to choose a parent. Yeah. So you got to step up and offer the other parent up and then he does and then you get your hug second. Yeah. Does it matter? No. But that those little things like that make a huge difference. And to Tracy's point, just her being there, loving and supporting these children or just supporting them because she likes them or she doesn't like them and she's just supporting her husband or boyfriend if that's going to create conflict for the children, don't go. Yeah. Tell them you'd love to hear about it, yeah. like Tracy did, because it the benefit doesn't outweigh the conflict. That, I I agree completely. Uh, Seth, a, a pivot to you about some legal issues. At, at what point are, are do step adjacent issues come to you? Conflict related to you know step parent relationships that we have some sort of legal concern all the time. They start with people who have been having an affairs and met the kids before the divorce is even over to we're divorced, new girlfriend or boyfriend is in the scene, is not taking Tracy's advice and is overstepping their bounds and you hear parent alienation, which is a term thrown around all the time that is really, I think, thrown around too much um, on what it actually means from a psychological perspective. But it's the feelings, it's the egos, it's all that getting in the way. So that comes up. And it also comes up, Pete, in a positive way that sometimes people don't realize. Sometimes the new spouse might be your best friend if you're the former spouse. because. When that guy is talking to that new spouse or new girlfriend, complaining about you, the ex-spouse, that person might say, 
Um, I went through a divorce and you're basically describing what my husband says about me. So what does that say about your relationship? And I think that kind of stuff matters. So there's a lot of dynamics, like Tracy said, but from a legal perspective, it can get messy, especially if there's allegations of abuse from the new person involved and mom or dad's not protecting the child. And in a lot of it, I, I find to be unfounded and it's egos getting in the way and people overstepping their bounds. I had a, I had a dear friend in high school who's dating a, a wonderful young woman and they were, they were a great idyllic couple. And one day they come to school and, and they're, they're really upset. And I, we're, you know, a bunch of us are standing in the hallway asking what's going on. And they said, well, our parents are getting married to each other. Uh, both of their parents were divorced, met each other at the soccer game, and just fell in love. And now, my girlfriend's dad is now my stepdad. What? Yeah, one of those relationships didn't last. You might be surprised to know which one. <laughs> anyway, this is really fantastic, and I think helpful. If you were to leave somebody with one piece of advice, 8 a.m. Monday morning, that they can they can sort of take to the bank in in building that trusting relationship with their new step kids, Tracy, what do you, wh how do you leave them? I think you have to trust the process that the best way to build the relationship is to, to stay out of the way. It's so counterintuitive and it's so hard to do, but it, it has served me 10,000 times in the last 15 years that when I stay out of the way, doesn't matter how old the kids are, when they have soaked up their fill of dad, they have room for me and there's no angst about me stepping in in place of their mom or, you know, in between them and their dad in some important way. You know, when when they get to fill up their tank of dad, that's when they have room for you as a stepmom. And um, and I think that that guys do that much more instinctively. It's their natural role to kind of watch what's happening and sort of step in at a moment where they can see that there's an opening for them. And, and women feel compelled to mother in a, in, in a way that you don't even notice because it's just instinctive. Too natural. Right. Right. Beautiful. Beautiful lessons. Thank you so much. Where would you like to send people to learn more about you and your coaching work? Well, my website is essentialstepmom.com. And I do have a podcast called Essential Stepmom. There is a website called undeletabledad.com as well. You can find it wherever uh, finer podcasts are served. I listened in uh, Apple Podcasts. It's in Spotify. Help on both sides of the relationship, all sides of the relationship. Tracy Poisoner, thank you so much for hanging out with us. Thank you for having me. This was a blast. Really enjoyed it, Tracy. Thanks for coming on. It was my pleasure. This was so much fun. I love your format. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. On behalf of uh, Seth Nelson and Tracy Poisoner, we're uh, thrilled to have you here listening to the show, downloading the show. We'll catch you next time right here on How to Split a Toaster, a divorce podcast about saving your relationships. Seth Nelson is an attorney with Nelson Coster Family Law and Mediation with offices in Tampa, Florida. While we may be discussing family law topics, How to Split a Toaster is not intended to, nor is it providing legal advice. Every situation is different. If you have specific questions regarding your situation, please seek your own legal counsel with an attorney licensed to practice law in your jurisdiction. Pete Wright is not an attorney or employee of Nelson Coster. Seth Nelson is licensed to practice law in Florida.